I'm so excited to be here. In case you don't know, I'm crazy for crowns in particular. So I really want to thank Jennifer for working with me the last couple of weeks to actually go into the collection and pick out pieces that we're going to talk about today that are near and dear to my heart, but also are huge influential items that um, I actually curate and conserve and then also uh, use influence, folklore influence from um, these pieces in my own work. So thanks a bunch, Jennifer. And no, I no problem. I, I'm like a crow. I'm drawn to all of these shiny objects. So <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Well, and it's funny, too, because um, actually when we first started talking about putting this presentation together and everything, um, I really was kind of focusing on um, just bridal jewelry in general. And I know that the Vesterheim has uh, many beautiful um, pieces, including the most elaborate piece, which is the um, bridal crown. So um, to give you a little bit of history, as far as like my interest in these particular items is like back in the early 90s, I had just gotten back from um, the Rowland Academy in Telemark, uh, taking um, some classes there in Norwegian filigree work. And uh, being over the top as I normally am, I thought, oh, I wanna make a bridal crown. I wanna do this tradition where anybody, no matter who you are or what economic strata you're from, you'd be able to rent a crown and be queen for a day. So even if you knew nothing about the history or the um, folklore of brides wearing a ton of silver on their wedding day from Scandinavia, everything like that, I wanted to take this on. But um, I didn't have the first clue how to go about making one. And uh, luckily, Lorraine Gilbertson being very kind with a lot of my questions. And I'm again, kind of like a crow as well, uh, said, well, I'll pull some crowns out for you. We'll put you in a room and you can examine how they are made. So um, the very first crown that we're going to look at uh, is the crown that I actually got to look at in, in order to do research for my own bridal crown. So if we can bring that one up, you get a good chance to see what that looks like. We're gonna run in here. And this is the crown. And this is, um, to tell you the truth, there is an original of this particular style of crown. Uh, and this is, we also have a reproduction. So this is um, a silver crown. I don't know if this is the reproduction or the original. I'm going to guess that it's the original. But um, this is, this, the original. is it the original? Yeah. Awesome. Yep, this is the original one. Perfect. Minus the original spangles. <laughs> Minus the original spangles. Some misinterpretation yes. with conservation. But um, according to the museum notes and the curator's notes, this is a crown that was made in um, by a silversmith in Trondheim from what we know, and is a Trondheim or a Trondelag style. And actually this piece is pretty amazing because it is like literally made from one long piece of silver. So I, I believe that this is about, oh, I'm gonna just check the notes here. I don't know if exactly like the top of the measurement, but it is one of those crowns that is like made from like one piece with like all these acanthus style sort of spirals in the center. Um, the spangles on this are interesting too because they're not our usual round um, spoons or scopa that you see on a lot of Scandinavian jewelry, but they are all leaves. Uh, they're renditions of leaves. And this is also an interesting piece in um, aspect that if you look around the base of it, there are little holes here because nine times out of 10, everyone looks at these crowns and they're like, how did people even wear these? So we're gonna get into a few photos of where we can actually see people wearing these. But this is actually, um, those holes in the crown are actually supposed to be attached to like a little um, fabric pillow, like a panabor, I believe is what it's called, which would sit on your head and your hair would get woven into it, covered with ribbons, and then supposedly it wouldn't fall off your head. Now, um, I have done conservation on the reproduction of this and they do fall off your head. So um, unless you put a ribbon around underneath sort of and tie it, it's, it can be a little cumbersome. But um, this particular crown has a really interesting history too, because we have lots of notes of the family that donated it. And then also if we could go to the next picture, 
there's some lovely um, provenance in a photo of um, a young lady looking very thrilled in a sleigh, a wooden sleigh, wearing the crown on her head. And as far as I can tell, Jennifer, is she also wearing her bunad? Yes, um, uh, she's also wearing wearing a bunad. So that would be appropriate to wear, obviously, with your with your crown. Right, and this actually um, shows the crown with there are there is a um, grouping of silk ribbons that go with this, correct? Yes, yes, yeah. So that's what you kind of see over over her shoulder here, and um, this was interesting because I know that sometimes a lot of things come to the museum that don't have a lot of provenance when people either gift them or they're purchased, and this is one where we have really nice provenance. We know the family, we know um, that uh, the gentleman Nils home. Home, home. Yes, he he came and he his family didn't have a lot to give him, but they gave him a sleigh or a sled and the crown, which is kind of strange because that seems like a pretty big thing. I don't know, but probably not in lieu of money to come to the United States as an immigrant. But um, the family had it for quite some time. So if we go to the next photo, you can actually see that they displayed this. Kind of Jennifer was really great. She circled like where the crown is in the in the photo. This is the, the home family sitting in their parlor and they have the, the bridal crown displayed in their in their parlor, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of just hanging off their their buffet up there over the fireplace. But um, really beautiful example. And also too, it doesn't sound like it was worn. As far as I can tell from the notes, it wasn't worn by anybody in the family for a wedding as far as I can tell, but it was just like a family sort of legacy piece that they own. So really beautiful and um, nice, nice piece to have in the collection as well. With, so, uh, Kath Kathleen just had a, uh, a little note that she said that she thought the hair was worn down. And I think in, you know, some of the pictures or the images that we have of, of brides, yes, they're, they're, there, it looks like the hair is down, but I do know that there's some hair that needs to go up to hold some of these in, in place. And so, um, and you probably know this too, Liz, from your work with other like bunads and, and things too, that um, sometimes you have hair wrapped in interesting, interesting ways for, and to hang on to headdresses and all kinds of, of things, but there's often some hair down um, when they're, when they're wearing those headdresses too. So anyway, well, that's a really good point because I think traditionally, um, in Norway, the girl would have to be beyond sort of like, you know, reproach as far as uh, attesting to her virginity, mm -hmm. which is the reason she'd be able to um, wear a crown on her wedding day. But they're all very young. And yes, their hair is completely loose. Um, but there is some hair that actually gets tucked up inside the center so that it can actually stay on the head if it's not being worn with the chin band. And that varies from region to region and yeah. style to style, too. Yeah, but, yeah it's a really, yeah, so, really good thing to point out. Yeah, so some of the crowns are are more like caps, or you know, they, they would actually stay on your head. You don't you don't have to walk around and try to balance them quite like like these. Yeah, and this 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 next slide that we have is again kind of the same sort of style where it's like basically you can see around the base there are little holes there, which is like where the um, fabric portion that you would put on the head to weave the hair into everything would actually be attached. And um, this one is actually a, um, a copper crown that was silvered and you can kind of still see some of the silver on the, um, on the uh, surface there. And again, some really unusual sort of like little leaf drops. And again, that sort of like acanthus style spires that come up from the very, very base. And I think that this one um, is not made all, well, it says cylinder of metal but I, upon closer inspection, I, this might be made in a couple different parts. But again, lots of big long sheets of metal that are actually decorated and then, you know, soldered together with one seam. So, oh, and it says what Ivy wants to know, what's written on the bottom? Yeah, so the inscription is, well, it has uh, um, perhaps the owner's name is on it. Uh, it's Endra Olson, which happens to be, I believe, a man's name. So probably not a man wearing this. Um, it has a date of uh, 1748. And then it also has an inscription that reads, retain the faith in this life, and then God will give you the crown. How appropriate, right? 
<laughs> All right. So as far as headdresses and bridal wear goes for, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's different styles for different regions. Um, I wanted Jennifer, and this was so great that she like got all these things because it's not enough just to look at the objects, but even with my own work, I like to see how the work works on the body. Like, how is it worn? Like, how is it relevant to, you know, different parts of your clothing or your neck or whatever? And this is actually a tinted, I believe it's a tinted photograph, right? Yes. Tinted photograph of um, a, a Voss, a Voss a bride. So as you can see, her headdress for a bridal day is actually almost like a flat sort of like um, beaded sheet with um, leaves and dangles hanging down too. And uh, this is interesting because it also is, as we get into the rest of the presentation, starting to show some other pieces that are worn besides the headdress on the wedding day. So I imagine she's looking in her jewelry box right now, but you can notice that she's wearing um, a soya up around her neck. And then very, if you look real closely, there's kind of a larger pendant that sort of is hanging down um, from her. You can kind of see it against the white of her apron. And that is um, an Agnus Day pendant, which we're going to look at later on in some of the images. Another beautiful, exquisite example of a crown that the Vesterheim has in their collection. And this is one that is um, just technically a wonder. I think this is silver with gilt leaves. You can see the silk ribbons on the back. And Jennifer, which, where is this one from? This Again. one comes from Bergen, um, yeah, so okay. Portland area of Norway, West Coast. Okay. Yeah, it's, Bergen seems to be a place where a lot of, well, the crown tradition actually emanated from just, you know, based on what we know, it was like a big fashion thing to do. And even when it went out of fashion in Bergen, it really took hold on the countryside, like all over, all, everybody wanted to wear it. So this is a really beautiful, beautiful one that has lots of interesting aspects. It's got the round, the round um, scopa or shells, the drops, and then also the leaves. And it's interesting too, this has a bit of color as well. Um, it's either blue enamel or glass, I think according to the curatorial uh, notes. But this is gorgeous because it is silver and uh, gilt, gold, uh, gold uh, plated but it's also um, embossed, engraved, pierced. And again, you'll notice the small little series of holes that go around the base of the crown itself, which uh, aids in attaching it to the top of your head. So you can imagine like how much sound this would make when you're walking um, to and from where you're going and uh, lots of lovely little flowers and rosettes on this as well. Maybe we have a couple, let's take a look at, uh, yeah, this is a really nice view. And I, are, the, are the silk ribbons original, Jennifer? Uh, yes, as, as far as we know. Um, we don't have a lot of information about how it was worn in or where it was worn or used in, in Norway, um, but they were wearing it in parades and act activities in lacrosse. <laughs> Wait, after they, yeah, after it was brought here to the United States, so. Interesting. Yeah, I, just a little bit of my research, it's like uh, uh, French silk ribbons or French silk was a big, big item, big item if you traveled to bring home. And just, you know, to be able to use that on any part of your clothing or any sort of like decoration was like a big deal. This is a really nice um, close up of some of the color in the rosettes here. Yeah, and this is this is one too that is made in um, several different panels. So you can kind of see to uh, in the image to the left, to the left, um, this is a piece that's actually, there's like a rivet that runs through this. So it's like six or seven or eight different panels. And then there's a pin that goes down too, which also beautiful, um, will also aid in if it needed to be taken apart and cleaned as well, because cleaning these things is quite a, quite a challenge um, if you happen to have one. Liz, and could you, could you um, share your knowledge of what the dangles are, are called um, on this and, and the soya? I know you've used the word spoon or scopa. Um, are there other, other words that you've come across? 
um, shells. Shells. Um, uh, it's one of my favorite topics because the more of these you have, it's like basically you'll you'll find those those uh, um, leaves, scopa shells, the drops, the the dangles, and the um, dome shapes. You'll find that in a lot of cultures, but it's really heightened in the Scandinavian culture because of fear of the Huldra folk, who could abduct or you abduct a bride on her way to church. It's supposed to deflect evil, like the evil eye, which is very popular in a lot of Middle Eastern um, and other uh, cultures to avoid that. And um, one story that's really great is that, you know, you you wear your your uh, pin or even on the bridal crown, all of these like beautiful reflective sort of dangles so that if you run into the devil, he would see his own reflection and be so horrified he would run away. So it's basically all kind of like a protective, a protective type element too. And then also just to kind of like, yeah, just keep, keep the evil away. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I've, I've gotten from it. Do you have some other, other yeah. insights to that? Yeah, no, that's uh, you know, it's, it's a part of the folklore traditions, but obviously these were important beliefs long ago. Yeah. Um, also, you know, silver thought to be kind of powerful, magical. I mean, you know, how are you going to kill a werewolf, but you got to, you know, silver bullet, you know, whatever um, that. And then also, I think, you know, in one of the previous images, you could really see some of what we tend to call kind of the sacred symbols. And you, you, you mentioned that. So diamond shapes and um, some of the floral shapes, and those, those were important motifs for protection and good luck too. So you'll see those motifs on the silver work, and you'll find that in the knitting, and um, you'll find it on other embroidery, on the boo nods, you know, um, also in woodenware, all kinds of things. So you see these, these symbols, and today we think of them more as patterns, but long ago they, were, they had meaning for protection and good luck and um, those kinds of things. Well, and that's interesting, too, because it also um, harkens back to, uh, you know, a baby's first pin, putting silver in the crib so that the, the older folk wouldn't take the child to take the silver instead. So they wouldn't replace it with one of their own ugly babies, I guess. But um, also, again, a very protective thing from the cradle, from the cradle all the way through life too, right into all those different um significant uh, points in a person's uh, life going from being, uh, you know, um, a, a child to an adult, and then finally to um, old age and into the grave. So now these are interesting too. These are part of the bridal accoutrement and these are um, considered Agnus Dei pendants. And is that going to be okay to say that for these, even though it's not like a locket? I don't want to get too crazy. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, and again, this is kind of like in my, in my own interpretation of this from my research is, is that the more silver that you could put on the bride, as in a lot of cultures, this is both protective, but it's also a show of wealth as well. So if you come from a really wealthy family, um, you might have a lot of your relatives and friends um, loaning you silver for the day, or maybe your family would own it. But in the case of a lot of these items, especially like with the bridal crown, um, a wealthy landowner would, might have a crown that he would loan out to local brides, like in exchange for, I don't know, a pair of mittens or a wooden box or something. Or, or basically, there would be um, somebody who would just have it in a church. A local parish would probably own one that a bride would be able to, to rent as well. So again, it, it really lends... It's very, it's a very equalizing sort of like day, your wedding day, where again, regardless of your economic strata, you still get to be queen for a day, at least one, one day in your life. And part of that were these like just piling on of like tons of uh, pins, brooches, um, buttons, silver buttons, your crown, um, and then also the Agnus Dei pendant, which I believe means um, uh, le uh, God's lamb. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. My Latin's a little rusty. Um, and usually, I think the two examples that we have are actually coins that represent um, kings who were actually uh, in, in power at the time, Denmark and Norway at the same time. So I believe that this is Frederick. If the, is that the F on yep. there, yep. Cr crowned? 
Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting because the the coins themselves now, of course, have no value because I, I, maybe they did, but they've got holes in them now. So they're actually it's actual money and everything. And then they've been spun out with the Scandinavian flair of the spoons and the leaves. Beautiful designs here, so that you have a nice big beautiful show of wealth too. And I believe that some of this is silver, but it's also been gilted, gilted with gold or gold plated as we put it. So very nice piece there. And not to be outdone, you just can't have a nice big crown and a whole bunch of pins and necklaces and whatever. And like that, this is the bridal belt. Um, this is um, very, very specific um, to married women. Young ladies do not wear this until they are married. And this is a particularly beautiful, beautiful example of one. And Jennifer, this is actually, was this part of um, a gift of one of the crowns as well? Yeah. Yep. So it matches that beautiful one that had the um, glass inserted into some of the um, dangles and uh, the one the one from lacrosse they wore this belt too you know <laughs> in the parades and all that so oh dear god <laughs> <laughs> well i'm always amazed because you know there are a few uh loggets you know all over minnesota that i've actually done conservation on things like from the turn of the century where people are still using it and they're wearing stuff out and they've been, you know, things have been redone several times over. Or if somebody just wants to rent it for a party, they're like, sure, no problem. And I'm like, no. Um, but they've been taking very good care of their stuff as well. So luckily we have this very beautiful example. This is actually um, silver that has been, is, it has gilt on it as well. Has all these wonderful uh, rondelles, rosettes on it. Um, these little, these little panels or these little, they're just incredible. This is a, a type of work called repousse, which is like basically where you take a flat sheet of metal and put it in a um, re, kind of like a, a sort of wax and like basically tap out the design from the back so that you get this nice sort of like high relief on the outside. And this particular belt is from Bergen. So, um, these belts, these designs would reflect, depending upon what region you were from, would reflect the design elements from your region. So I know I've worked on a couple belts from Bergen, which actually have like three dots over some buildings, which represent the three mountains behind them. Um, this is kind of like a rose pattern. Um, and again, if you could afford a lot of these, this would actually show off your wealth and also, again, protect you against the evil eye as well. This is a really nice one um, that Jennifer picked out because it's got really shining examples of the amount of technical expertise that goes into these. So again, you can see this is the end of the, um, the belt sash and you can see little faces that are actually, again, this like iconography against, you know, the evil eye and protective elements is worked into the clothing and into the adornment of um, the bride's pieces. Um, these are what they would call glub, glub faces. And um, actually, I think even in the Westerheim's um, brooch collection, they have some brooches that actually have human faces on them as well, which are very, this is very old style. And again, you can see these beautiful leaves and the, the lovely, the lovely um, relief pattern on this. And this is really especially cool too, because once we flip it over, we go to the next one. Oh, we're going to the buckle first. Okay, I forgot about that. Yep, and here's some more of the glib faces on the buckle. So there's one actually at the very, very end there. You can kind of see it's got like a little sun hairdo on there, but then also too, the little faces which is um, interesting because it goes from being just sort of like a decorative piece to one that has, is just loaded with like a ton of, you know, um, icons and uh, symbols too for protection. All right, so this is, I guess what I had jumped ahead here. All right, so on the back of the end of that rounded sort of tongue shape on the sash, this is nice because um, a lot of examples that are um, that find their way to museums aren't necessarily stamped. So again, it offers a really lovely, a lovely um, 
kind of like legacy and historical chronological line if things have been stamped. So um, the biggest, one of the biggest um, silver, silversmithing guilds was in Bergen that produced a lot of these pieces. So you had to be, you had to be a master goldsmith in order to um, make jewelry and then also to get your stamp and be endorsed by the guild. So this actually has five stamps. And for those of you that are kind of into this sort of thing, um, I had to go back a couple of weeks ago and um, uh, look up Carol Hasbold's lovely um, uh, piece on hallmarking. So that's available at the museum, as I understand, I think. Um, but anyway, she did a lovely extensive study into what all of these symbols mean. So for example, in there's five symbols here. And if you look in the lower left, as far as I can tell, um, the guilds would have four to five stamps. One will be the stamp of the actual guild itself. And the second would might be the initials or would be the initials of the, of the artist. Um, the down in the lower left, it's interesting because they um, would use astrological symbols or, you know, like this is, I believe it's like a Sagittarius and that would say what month the piece was actually made or the year of it too. There's also a hallmarking point that will attest to, I believe that's over on the right here, as far as the assay to attest to the purity of the silver itself. And it's interesting because um, even though there were guilds and people weren't supposed to be producing or making jewelry um, outside of the guild construct, lots of bonder silver, which is farmer silver, People all over Norway are like, you know what? If like somebody gives me some money and I need my daughter needs something, I'm melting it down and I'm making her something. So there are like lots of examples, especially in the Vesterheim's collection. And I, I encourage you, if you can, to go online and look at look at their collection. They have some beautiful pieces on there. Not all of them are stamped or hallmarked, but the styles and the expertise again of people working in the country is amazing, and not just within the construct of a very heavily monitored guild. So I am open for questions. I have goosebumps now because I'm just like, this is, been dreaming about doing a talk like this forever and ever. And Jennifer, like, is there anything else within the stamps that I'm not grasping because some of it's sort of a little blurry? No, um, yeah, you're, I mean, you're right. Each of the, um, the towns, Cities would have had their own their own stamps so that tells you where it's from. The master gold, goldsmith of the of that particular town, um, who was overseeing all of the guild all of the guilds' works, you know, would would stamp. Um, you're right about the um, silver, and so there are different marks at um, for the uh, master goldsmith. There are different marks sometimes for the silver content based on what year. It, it is so um, you can actually learn a lot from from the stamps um, then you have to kind of you kind of have to do some digging though and then some of these as you can see the stamp isn't always as clear as you <laughs> as you would like to um, have it so it sometimes takes a little bit of digging or perhaps you just squint your eyes and say what does that look like <laughs> you know based on based on what you might see on other other things so oh. Let's see. Kathleen wants to know what is the name of the document? Are you talking about? Is that? Yeah. So I think. Yeah. So I think her. Um, I think Carol's. It was um, silver. A uh, shining heritage. I think is what it. What it yep. is. Um, I can't. I don't remember the exact title off the bat, but it's it's some combination of <laughs> of those words. It's blue. It's blue, and it has a beautiful drinking horn on the, on the cover of it. And I should have had it down here to show because it's it's a it's it's really a wealth of knowledge. And she goes into not just um, bridal jewelry, but she also goes into some of the um, the actual like drinking horns and coffee cups and and things like that, and how the style started to kind of evolve over time with Scandinavian influence. So but, we have some uh, more questions too, right, Jennifer? Pardon. Can you see there's a few more questions yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to go back to um, Cynthia. She asked if uh, if we had said that uh, brides in Norway could be abducted for forced marriage. Um, well, I, I, 
I don't know about any any stories of, of that exactly. Some of you some of you may, but there were certainly some arranged arranged marriages. And I think uh, Liz and I were sort of alluding to abduction by forces of of evil, like folklore and trolls. I mean, you can read all kinds of stories of abduction by you know those those uh, those beings. Um, but you know, you can. Uh, you can always trick a troll, so usually it ends up being being an okay deal for uh, for the folks in those stories. But um, yeah, but there, you know, certainly some some arranged arranged marriages happening. Well, and Loran, I know, um, did a talk, I believe, maybe it was a year ago, last April, and there you can look it up online, and it's actually the name of the story is the interrupted wedding, where a woman is basically she. Come, runs into her fiance and he's like, let's get married now. And she's like, okie dokie. And all of a sudden these people appear and they're dressing her and putting on all this beautiful silver on her. But her little dog suspects something is up and is just barking his fool head off. And somebody in the wedding party says, don't worry, help will come soon. So then she ties a ribbon from her hair around the little dog and he runs down the mountain, finds the fiance and her father and they come up and basically like sound off a gun and everybody disappears. But before everyone disappears, somebody grabs some of the silver. And so that's kind of like the, the legend of like why this particular family has a beautiful crown that's like the technique, technical aspect of it is unsurpassed and it's beautiful. And all of the Holder folk, I guess, turn into like puffs of wool and just roll away. So you can look that up for your enjoyment. 